Hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I am your host, and my name's Larry Erickson. And uh, for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be ranting away at you at things that I think are important that you should know about and um, hopefully do something about. If at any point you have any comments, questions, reactions to the show, you can email to the, uh, them to me. The email address is whoviating, W H O V I A T I N G, at AOL.com. Or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can leave the message there. Um, leave a comment there, or you can get the email address from there if you'd rather. If you do email me, please include something in the subject line so I know it's not spam, and uh, be a little patient because I'm actually kind of slow about answering email, but I do answer it. You will get an answer. All right, we're going to start right off now with uh, the way I always like to start whenever I can, with some good news. And this week, we're going to start with the big good news. Israel and Hamas have agreed to what an Israeli government official called an unlimited ceasefire, which puts an end, at least for now, to the slaughter in Gaza. According to one source, the deal supposedly includes reopening of the blockaded border crossings and a widening of the area in the Mediterranean where uh, residents of Gaza can go to fish without worrying about being attacked by Israeli gunboats. But the Israeli daily newspaper Haaretz uh, says that actually Hamas got nothing immediate out of the ceasefire, so that's actually not clear. Negotiations are to resume next month in Cairo on a long-term agree agreement which would involve a permanent reopening of the border crossings, a prisoner exchange, and the construction of a Gaza seaport. Now those talks are actually where the real test of this unlimited ceasefire is going to rise. But for the moment. The uh, Haaretz says that the sense is that this time the truce will hold because, quoting, both sides seems interested in putting an end to this terrible summer. Uh, still, uh, apparently the feeling among both Israelis and Palestinians is that the war did not end in a victory or a loss for either side, but rather in, quoting the paper again, a somewhat doleful tie. That actually does not bode well for the future because it could lead each side to settle into a sort of sullen determination to achieve at the negotiating table what they could not achieve in the fighting. On the other hand, there, there is one little note, one little ding of hope that I see. Uh, yet another port, uh, report in Haaretz says, I'm quoting, the significance of the ceasefire is that Israel has recognized militant groups as an inseparable part of the Palestinian polity. That is, Israel is coming to admit that it can't simply dismiss uh, uh, groups such as Hamas and Islamic Jihad from having any role in any kind of future Palestinian state. Now since, as is too often forgotten, uh, a possibility of a more complete settlement several years ago was uh, undermined because Israel and the U.S. refused to recognize a coalition government of Hamas and Fatah, a, uh, a role which Hamas won by doing well in the very local elections that Israel and the U.S. demand take place. Um, since that possibility of settlement broke down for that reason, the fact that Israel may finally be coming to accept the political realities among Palestinians, that can be a good thing. Or we also have some good news on another front, uh, which by now is a familiar one, marriage justice. On August 21st, Federal District Judge Robert Hinkle ruled that Florida's ban on same-sex marriages is unconstitutional. Now, previously in the state, four different county-level state judges had found that, uh, but this federal court ruling affects the entire state. Hinkle noted that his is now one of 19 federal courts that have struck down state laws barring same-sex couples from marrying. Now, while most of those decisions, including this one, were stayed pending appeal, all those decisions reached the same conclusion. Banning same-sex marriages violates the due process and equal protection provisions of the U.S. Constitution. 
Hinkle noted that it took the U.S. Supreme Court 200 years to invalidate laws banning uh, uh, interracial marriage, and he declared that, quoting, when observers look back 50 years from now, the argument supporting Florida's ban on same-sex marriage, though just as sincerely held, will again seem an obvious pretext for discrimination. Observers who are not now of age will wonder just how those views could have been held. Uh, the decision, by the way, also covered Florida's ban on recognizing same-sex marriages performed out of state. Now, I've said before that it seems like just about every one of these pro-justice decisions has some memorable line. Here's Hinkle's. After saying that the institution of marriage had survived the end of the bans on interracial marriage and would surely survive the end of bans on same-sex marriage, he said, quoting, liberty, tolerance, and respect are not zero-sum concepts, which I say is very well said. Uh, there's actually more good news on this front. During oral arguments on August 26th, a three-judge panel of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals were barely short of openly hostile to arguments from the states of Indiana and Wisconsin, each of which is appealing a decision by a district court to throw out their laws banning same-sex marriage. For example, Judge Richard Posner blew away the argument of Wisconsin Assistant Attorney General Timothy Samuelson, who tried to use tradition as a justification for banning same-sex marriage. It was, Posner said, tradition to allow, not allow blacks and whites to marry, a tradition that got swept away. He called prohibition of same-sex marriages as drawn from, quoting him, a tradition of hate and savage discrimination. Lawyers for the two states also fell back on the old cliched arguments about regulating procreation, which didn't appear to press, impress the judges here any more than they did in any of the other places where those arguments have been tried and flopped. This is actually the fifth time a federal circuit court of appeals has heard arguments in a marriage equality case since last year's Supreme Court ruling striking down central parts of the Defense of Marriage Act. Uh, previously, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals had heard two cases. Uh, the Fourth Circuit and the Sixth Circuit had heard one each. Three of those previous four cases have already seen decisions, the two in the Tenth and the one in the Fourth. All three upheld lower court rulings in favor of marriage justice. Now, the Sixth Circuit hasn't ruled yet, but many advocates for marriage equality are bracing for that to be their first loss in federal court. But even so, even allowing for that, with uh, w uh, things appear to be going well in the Seventh Circuit, that would still mean three circuits out of four and four decisions out of five where justice rose. Same-sex marriage is now legal in 19 states in the District of Columbia, and that is in addition to all of the states affected by these various court rulings. So I say again, on this front, justice is coming. It's just a question of how soon. Uh, and moving on from there, I have some three very brief, and this time I mean it, very brief updates to things I've mentioned uh, recently. Two weeks ago, I mentioned the shooting of 22-year-old John Crawford at a Walmart in Ohio. Police demanded that he drop the weapon and unloaded BB gun, and when he didn't obey instantaneously, but instead said, it's not real, they shot him to death. Crawford, I'm tempted to say, of course, was African-American. The update here is that Ohio Attorney General Mike DeWine has appointed a special prosecutor to look into the case. Now, the family wants the DOJ to step in, as it did in the case of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, but DeWine suggested that the DOJ will probably wait until after the state makes its determination and then decide if federal action is needed. On another front, last week I condemned New Orleans for joining the ranks of U.S. cities stri striving to make homelessness invisible rather than trying to do something about it, and just shunting people into shelters is not doing something about it. The update here is that some places actually are trying to do something. The city of Portland, Oregon, for example, is nearing approval of a project to construct communities of tiny homes on public land in order to house homeless and low-income families. The houses are only 192 square feet, but they are well designed and more importantly, they provide a stable place of residence. Not a bed in an overcrowded shelter, but a stable place, a place, if you will, to plant your feet so you can stand up again. 
They would cost $250 to $350 a month to rent, so people making as little as $5,000 a year could manage to afford them. Other tiny house projects of various sorts have been seen in a half dozen places, uh, including places in, for example, Wisconsin, Texas, and New York. And in those cases, the houses are often built with the assistance of the local Occupy movement. Portland hopes to have its first micro-community in place by February. All right, and our third update. Uh, last week, I made John DeLeonardis, owner of the Delcy Drive-In Theater in Vineland, New Jersey, uh, the week's clown because of his refusal to allow a 16-year-old diabetic to enter the theater with his emergency kit because it contained contraband. That being his diabetic supplies, including a juice, a juice box and some candy to protect against the potentially life-threatening crash in his blood sugar levels. No food, no drink, bottom line, De Leonardo said. Sorry your kid has an affliction, but what can I tell you? He later told local media he has no plans to change his policy against outside food. Uh-huh. Amazing what a little bad publicity can do. The theater website section on house rules now contains a section specifically stating that diabetic supplies, including glucerna-type drinks, these are like a family of, of drinks that are speci uh, specifically designed for diabetics, glucerna-type drinks, hard candies, and bottled waters are not considered outside food or beverage. Now. I'm not sure if this makes him less of a clown because he changed the policy or more of a clown because he doesn't admit what drove the change. Uh, and sort of a uh, footnote to that, it raises an example. This case raises an example of one of our occasional features. It's called unintentional humor. And this is where um, something that's not intended to be funny really just is. The house rules at... Um, well, the thing is, when the story first came out, a lot of people were wondering how De Leonardis knew what was in the bag. Well, the house rules of the theater also say, and I'm quoting, trunks and hatches must be popped and interior lights must be on upon approach to the box office. That is, they are going to more or less search your car to make sure uh, that they don't have anything and before they'll let you in. There's also a section that indicates that theater employees are roaming the lines between the cars and can at any moment demand you produce your ticket to avoid getting kicked out. And after that, the rules point to, and I'm quoting, the increased freedom resulting from an open air environment. And that's just funny. All right, last before the break, one of our regular features, it's the outrage of the week. We've known for some time now that the NSA, the National Security Agency, has been spying on Americans, collecting huge amounts of information about the metadata of our telephone calls, recording what number called what number, when, from where to where, and for how long. That information is supposedly only available to a limited number of NSA employees who can access it only in terrorism-related investigations. But beyond that and beside that, the NSA has swept up some 850 billion records about phone calls, emails, cell phone locations, and internet chats, and more. Now, this information uh, that they're getting is supposed to be related to foreign intelligence, but the reality is that data uh, will also include data on unknown millions of Americans, uh, and that data collected on Americans either accidentally or deliberately. Well, now it develops that the NSA has developed what uh, some are calling its own version of Google, a massive searchable database called IC Reach, uh, a database to which more than 1,000 analysts at 23 federal agencies, including purely domestic ones such as the FBI and the DEA, have access. Information shared through IC Reach can be used to track a person's movements, map out their network of associates, and potentially reveal their religious affiliations and political beliefs. In fact, part of the idea of this was to enable what's called pattern of life analysis, which involves monitoring an individual, seeing who they communicate with, the places they visit over a period of several months, in order to be able to predict their ha determine their habits and so predict their future behavior. Now, rather than being an actual repository, IC Reach appears to be a querying tool that can scan a variety of databases held by the NSA. 
The information in those databases was swept up by programs authorized under Executive Order 12333. Uh, the collection of data under this order does not have any court oversight and receives minimal congressional scrutiny because it supposedly targets only foreign communication networks rather than domestic ones. But despite that supposed limitation, the very nature of the program means that data, again, about unknown millions of Americans will be included even if they are not suspected of any wrongdoing. And that information, which is supposed to be applied only to investigations related to foreign intelligence, is now, and for several years has been, it turns out, been shared with domestic law enforcement. And the differences between what is foreign intelligence and what is domestic intelligence continue to shrink. The difference between the Constitution applies because it's domestic and the Constitution doesn't apply because it's foreign becomes ever more blurred. And what was supposed to be a bright red line separating one from the other is now more of a dusty rose. They fake it, they fudge it, they finagle it. But at the end of the day, all of this merges into one giant spy network. They're spying on anyone and everyone, and yes, that includes us, and that is an outrage. And we're going to take a break. We're back. All right. Uh, last week, I said that the protests in Ferguson, Missouri, were not really about the shooting down of Michael Brown, but rather were really about everything that happened before that. Um, that his death was not the cause, it was the lens through which all of the causes were focused. I mentioned the increasing poverty in the town, the increasing unemployment, and the fact of a militarized police force that looks nothing like the community where it operates. I want to touch on that again, that last part, uh, that what happened before with regard to relations with the police, but from a slightly different perspective than the militarization. The question of whether or not there was racial profiling of blacks in the city by the 95% white police force. How to put that another way, did the bulk of the community of Ferguson experience their interactions with police? Now, an NPR story actually asked that question of people in Ferguson and got the sort of answers that should come as no surprise to anyone who's been paying attention. One said, every time I see a cop, it's like, am I going to get messed with? A father said, I should not have to teach my children how to be arrested. I should not have to teach my son to do everything possible to not get killed when a cop pulls him over. A woman told the story of her 12-year-old son who came home in tears after being stopped on the street while walking home and patted down by a cop. He said, Mom, how long will this happen to me? And I told him, the rest of your life. And I think if you want to persist in thinking that all of this is fantasy, this is all just hyperbole, it's all people making too much out of too little, get over yourself and all that nonsense, well, here are some hard figures for you. In 2013, the Ferguson Police Department made 5,384 stops, conducted 611 searches. 86% of the stops and 92% of the searches were of black people. About 65% of the town is black. Oh, the bigots will cry. That just shows that black people are more likely to be criminals. That's not profiling. That's just reasonable. Except, same year, same police figures. Once you allow for the differences in the number of people in town, differences in the population, it works out that African Americans were nearly twice as likely to have been subjected to a search as whites were and were twice as likely to get arrested, even though whites were more than one and a half times more likely to have been found to be carrying contraband during one of these searches. They were one and a half times more likely to have contraband, but only half as likely to get arrested. And if that does not demonstrate a pattern of racial discrimination in the policing of Ferguson, I can't imagine what would short of a signed confession. Look, let, let's face facts here. Okay, let's face some facts. Most cops are good cops. Okay? Most cops are trying to do the best they can for the communities in which they work. But when you give people, when, 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 you, when you have people, you have people, you give them a badge and a gun. You give them the authority to kill people. You give, you, 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 these people are trained, cops are trained 
to smack down any challenge to their authority. The cops will tell you, an, an LAPD cop in an uh, 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 op-ed in the Washington Post just, um, just last week, an LAPD cop said, and I'm quoting now, if you don't want to get shot, tased, pepper sprayed, struck with a baton, or thrown to the ground, just do what I tell you. That is, in other words, just shut up and passively submit to anything I want, even if it violates your rights, even if I have no authority, even if it abuses my authority, because if you argue with me, I'll just beat the crap out of you if you're lucky, or arrest you if you're still alive, and whatever happened to you was your fault. By the way, you know, it's not illegal to argue with a cop. It's not illegal to give a cop lip. It's not illegal to, to be obnoxious to a cop. When you have people who are increasingly trained, as cops now are increasingly trained to think in terms of us versus them, when you have people who are increasingly being armed with weapons of war to patrol city streets, when you have that kind of situation, then quite frankly, most is not good enough. Because Ferguson's not the exception, it's the rule. Kimberly Norwood is a law professor at Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. She confessed recently that when driving, she's a bit of a lead foot. But she said, quoting her, the few times I have been stopped in my suburb, the first question I'm always asked is, do you live around here? None of her white friends, she said, who had been pulled over, never, not once, had they ever been asked that question. On August 27th, TV producer Charles Belk was in Beverly Hills to attend a pre-Emmy event. He was suddenly arrested, handcuffed, made to sit on the curb, then booked on a charge of taking part in an armed robbery at a city bank with bail set at $100,000. His car was impounded, he was denied a phone call, and he wasn't given an explanation of why he was being held. The reason turned out to be he is a tall, bold black man. And that was a description the cops had of one of the robbers. So apparently they just grabbed the first tall, bald black man they saw on the assumption he must be a criminal. Six hours later, after he made repeated requests, the cops actually looked at the film from the security camera at the bank. And guess what? It wasn't him. They let him go. He's supposed to be grateful. On August 23rd, Kamichi Barber was driving in 40, Texas with her three young children, ages six to nine. She was stopped by police. She was made to get out of the car and walk backwards towards the cops where she was handcuffed. Why? The cops tell her that they had a 911 call about, quote, a vehicle matching your description and your license plate waving a gun out the window. Here's the problem. The 911 call was about four young black men waving a window, a gun, out of the window of a beige or tan colored Toyota. This was a woman with small children driving a burgundy red Nissan Maxima. Only one thing in the description actually matched, the color and not of the car. The cops realized their mistake when Barbara's six-year-old son got out of the car and in a heartbreaking moment started walking toward the cops with his hands up. Ferguson is not the exception. It happens to people of color in this country everywhere, every day. Everywhere, every day, African Americans are assumed to be criminals. They are stopped, hassled, harassed for no reason other than the color of their skin. That's why there is such a dramatic difference, a 20 percentage point difference between the attitudes of whites and blacks on the question of trusting police. It is the dramatic difference in their day-to-day -day experiences. So yeah, most cops are good cops, but most just isn't nearly good enough. I'm going to stop there with that and make a slight detour to give a hero award. Hero award is something we give, around, give out around here uh, when somebody just does the right thing on a matter big or small. The award this time goes to John Stewart of The Daily Show. On his show for August 26th, he spent roughly the first 10 minutes on a truly truly righteous rant about the refusal of white Americans to recognize the pervasive existence of racism.
Now, the link to this video will be on my blog as soon as it comes up, but I encourage you, I plead with you, I beg with you, get online, go to the, go to the library if you, if you need to get online that way. Somehow, watch this segment, because I'm going to tell you, I would have been proud had I done that segment. All right, now uh, for the Clown Award, our other regular weekly feature, the Clown Award, given always for acts of meritorious stupidity. The big red nose this week goes to the Warhawks in Congress, exemplified by these two folks, John McCain and Lindsey Graham. The Hawks, they are eager. They are champing at the bit. They are straining at the lead. They want more war. For example, Representative Paul Ranton said on August 23rd that the United States military needs to, quote, finish ISIS off because we'll either fight them here or we'll fight them there. And that should be true even if that meant deployment of ground troops to Iraq or Syria because that should not be off the table. For his part, Lindsey Graham Cracker argued Monday that Obama, quote, is derelict in his duties by not aggressively confronting ISIS wherever they reside, including Syria, because, he said, anything less than attacking their safe haven in Syria is placing the American homeland at risk. And by the way, do you get as creeped out as I do when these people start talking about the, the homeland when did that sort of hyper-militarist, hyper-nationalist kind of language become acceptable and common? In any event, getting back to the thing, the Washington Post editorial board says the U.S. needs to pull together a coalition of, quoting, Kurds in Iraq and Syria, Sunni tribal leaders in Iraq, the Iraqi government, if it can become more inclusive, and what's left of the free Syrian army, put some boots on the ground, and launch a war on the cross-border area of Iraq and Syria. They are all out for war, perhaps missing, perhaps they just miss the smell of napalm in the morning. They are all ready for the blood and gore and guts and veins in your teeth and eating burnt dead bodies and shrink I want to kill. But there's one thing they're not all out for, taking responsibility. For example, on August 26th, Representative Michael Turner blasted Obama as not having a coordinated plan to defeat ISIS. But when he was asked if he would support U.S. airstrikes targeting ISIS sites in Syria, he would not answer the question. In fact, Politico reports that few lawmakers really want to take a vote on military action this close to the November elections. But it's not even the elections. In 2013, which was not even an election year, lawmakers were privately relieved when the Obama administration re withdrew its request for congressional authorization for strikes in Syria. Robert Chesney, a professor at the University of Texas who specializes in national security, said the preferred position for many in Congress is not to be on record one way or the other in this situation. Well, actually, I have to agree. They do want to be on record. They want to be on record with tough talks and sweeping claims about the necessity of regional war and blather about the homeland and fight them there or fight them here and lots of macho talk fear mongering. They just don't want to be on record in any way that involves them having any responsibility. They are, all of them, not just these two, all of them, they are without doubt clowns. And I have one last thing. Um, this is a very quick sidebar. I had another potential clown this week, but I passed it up because it was just way too easy. The hate-filled West, Westboro Baptist Church apparently wanted to issue the Ice Bucket Challenge to Equality House, the rainbow-painted house run by Planting Peace that stands across the street from their compound. Now, you know about the Ice Bucket Challenge, okay? Well, the Westboro Baptist Church, which is not part of any Baptist convention, it is not actually a church, wanted to challenge Equality House. And how did they do it? by dumping the ice water on a sign on their lawn. So not only are they bigots and clowns, they are wimps. And that's it for this week. Well, you're out of here. You have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week, but for now, peace.